Welcome to the second lecture in Basics of Scattering Amplitudes. I'm recording this second lecture in two parts. In the first part, I'll introduce the 40 spinner helicity formalism for massless particles. And in the second part, I'm going to apply it to a selection of examples. Let's recall that in lecture number one, we studied scalar models and we learned how locality, factorization, dimensional analysis, and symmetries play key, play key roles for determining the physical amplitudes without reference to Lagrangians. And then understanding the amplitudes allowed us to the, explore the space of field theories. In particular, we studied scalar models that have vanishing soft limits, meaning that when I take one of the particles momenta, external particle momenta, and I scale it to zero with some factor epsilon going to zero, then the amplitude would vanish and it would vanish at some power sigma that we call the soft weight. Sigma is uh, some positive integer for this to happen. This is the case in certain cases of spontaneous symmetry breaking where these particles phi would be the Goldstone bosons. In the third lecture, I'll, I'll study limits with soft factors that are negative. That means these are divergent soft limits. But in order to get some interesting results there, we'll need to study particles with spin. And one very helpful formalism to study massless particles with spin is the 4D spin helicity formalism. There's also a spin helicity formalism for massive particles. There are, in fact, various forms of it that are very useful. Uh, and to keep things simple, uh, in these lectures, I'll stick to massless particles. That's also what we need in order to dis discuss the soft limits. So let's recall that for 4D massless particles, we can characterize them using the helicity label. Helicity tells you whether the spin of the particle points in the direction of the momentum or in the opposite direction. Now, for a scalar, we assign helicity zero because it doesn't have any spin, it has spin zero. And here I'm recording alongside with the particles also their external Feynman rules. Ah, these will be very useful for later. Fermions have spin one half. With, with spin one halves, we assign helicity plus or minus one half. And recall that the external state wave functions, depending on whether they're fermions or antifermions or outgoing or incoming, are u and v and u bar and v bar. And they, they carry a label plus minus, which refers to the helicity in, in a certain helicity basis. For vector particles like photons and gluons, they have spin one. And their helicities are assigned as h equals plus minus one. Of course, these come with polarization vectors E and E star, depending on whether they're incoming and outgoing. We Just for, for the record, let's also talk about gravitinos, which have spin three halves. They are assigned helicity plus or minus one half. And the, their external uh, Feynman rules can be composed out of a fermion spin one half wave function put together with a spin one a, um, polarization with matching up positive and negative helicity labels so that the total helicity adds up to plus or minus three halves. And finally, we'll discuss gravitons also. Gravitons have spin two massless particles. They have helicity plus or minus two. And their polarizations can be written as simple products of photon polarizations. Now, it's extremely useful to work uh, with amplitudes that have all states outgoing. And we can do so by using crossing, sy crossing symmetry. This helps us simplify the labels and everything else. In particular, it makes it very easy to write momentum conservation instead of saying that the sum of incoming momenta has to equal the sum of outgoing momenta and deal with the signs that that ensues. We simply have that all the momenta have to add up to zero. For an n-particle amplitude, the sum of the n-momenta must be zero. Also, it simplifies that for the fermion wave functions, we only need to do, deal with the outgoing wave functions. And we can do so by using the crossing relations that when I flip the momentum from outgoing to ingoing or ingoing to outgoing, I will necessarily also flip the helicity. And that's why you see this helicity flip in these crossing relations for the fermion wave functions. So in all amplitudes that I'll discuss in these lectures, I'll be assuming that the states are all outgoing. Okay, now the key point is that we're going to introduce a simplifying notation for the Fermi wave functions, and then it will turn out, and I'll show you how, 
all the amplitudes of, of just massless particles can be written in terms of those new variables in that simplified notation. So we're dealing here with massless on-shell fermions, and as well as anti-fermions for that matter. And the fermion wave functions that you normally write for the amplitude for the positive helicity case will be written in terms of some two component commuting spinners that are called square spinners, here denoted in orange. They're square spinners uh, with indices that are undotted that run over one and two. So recall that the U and U bars and Bs and B bars are four component spinners. Uh, but here we are writing them in a helicity basis that selects out a two-component form. So for positive helicity uh, fermions, we have the square spinners. And for negative helicity, we have a basis where we have angle spinners. And the A dot index runs likewise over 1 and 2. So these angle and square spinners are two-component commuting spinners. That means that they're not Grassmann valued but they can be moved around uh, without any cost of signs. The indices on these spinners are raised and lowered with this two index Levi-Civita symbol, as I've written out here. Now, for example, if I have a Yukawa model with a scale of phi interacting with two fermions, then you have uh, cubic interactions with the scalar and the two fermions, and then you have to remember whether they're ingoing and outgoing and which way time goes and plus and minus and so on and so forth. And to trace the line backwards against the arrow and all that stuff that you learned about in your quantum field theory class. One of the powers of spin helicity is that with all particles outgoing, all you have to remember is one thing. Positive helicity goes with square spinners and negative helicity goes with angle spinners. And that's really all you need to know, then we can forget about U's and U-bars and so forth. In particular here, if I look at this vertex and I assign positive helicities to the two fermions, then I can see that for to get a Lorentz invariant quantity here, I need to contract the A index, and the contraction of the A index in this manner is what I define to be a square bracket 1, 2. Note here that the 1 and the 2 simply refer to the particle labels 1 and 2 for the, for the uh, momenta. Likewise, if I assign negative helicities to both the fermion lines, then the wave functions that they go with to get a Lorentz invariant uh, expression, then I simply need to contract those indices with each other, and that is what I define to be an angle bracket. So again, negative helicities go with angle brackets, positive helicities goes with square brackets. And there's really nothing else it can be to be a Lorentz invariant express expression. I have to contract those indices with each other. Note that because indices are raised and lowered with the Levi-Civita symbol, then if I interchange the order of the indices uh, or the labels a, i and j to be j and i, then that's going to cost me a sign because I have to raise and lower indices. Likewise, then this is true both for the angles and the square brackets. And that's an important quantity. That means that a squared bracket i with i, of course, will have to vanish. And likewise, i with i angle bracket vanishes. Okay, we also learn that if I, if I put opposite uh, helicities on my Yukawa coupling vertex, then I will get zero because there's no possible Lorentz invariant contraction I can possibly have here. So I would learn that on shell, an amplitude, a free particle amplitude with positive and negative helicity fermions and a scalar in Yukawa theory would necessarily be zero. But the same helicity contractions we calculated above, those give angles and square spinners uh, respect respectively. Note that under exchanges of identical particles, these are identical particles uh, in the amplitude, this angle and square bracket, due to the, its anti-symmetry, will change sign. And that is exactly what you want for the kind of Dirac uh, Fermi statistics that you need for identical fermions. This is, of course, opposed to what we had for the cases with just scalars, where we needed to have both symmetry for exchanges of identical particles. Now, in the following 
I'm going to illustrate how these angle and square spinners are related to the momentum of particles. After all, in order to write amplitudes in terms of angles and square brackets, I will need to relate them to momenta because momenta arises, for example, from the internal lines or from interactions with high derivative terms. So one thing I do want to emphasize is that when we write the angles and square brackets of some momentum, we are implicitly saying that this is a null vector, that it has it corresponds to an on-shell massless particle, because otherwise it does not make sense to even talk about angle and square spinners. All right, so let's get going. So we have a Dirac equation. That was how we even got to the point of having fermion wave function. And that says that d slash on psi, the wave function, so the, the, um, the, the fermion field is zero. This is the Dirac equation, of course, for the massless case. If we go to momentum space, the derivative becomes momentum and we get p slash on u is zero. That's how it acts and how it, you in fact determine the fermion wave functions in the first place. What is p slash? p slash is dotted into the, in four dimensions, the four by four gamma matrices, which I can write in a certain basis using the Pauli matrices sigma and sigma bar. And when I can keep track of my index structure of these sigmas, then I see that I can write my four by four matrix in a two by two block diagonal form, where I have a P with lower indices A and B dot, and a P with upper indices A dot and B. And of course, these indices are again raised and lowered with the two index Levi-Civitas. Written out explicitly, I would have that my uh, two by two matrix P lower A B dot is written in this form here in terms of the four components of the four vector P mu. All right. Now, one of the things you notice, of course, is then that P squared being zero, that this is a null vector or corresponding to an on-shell massless particles, is the statement that P zero squared minus vector P squared is zero. And you can use here your favorite notation for, um, for the signature. I haven't been explicit about this. Um, you, can, you can look in textbooks or uh, references that have each their own conventions. All right, but this, you see, this condition that a vanishing of p squared being zero is exactly the same that you get if you compute the determinant of this two by two matrix p lower a b dot. So the statement that p was on shell and massless is equivalent to the statement that the determinant of the two by two matrix p vanishes. Likewise, of course, for the upper index p, because that was related just by contractions with Levi-Civitas. What this means is that the two by two matrix P has rank one whenever P is massless and on shell. Let's keep that in mind. Now, from the Dirac equation, we can get a two component form, which is the Weyl equation. And so the massless Weyl equation will, in using the definition we used for U plus minus and V plus minus and so on, will take the following form, namely that P as a two by two matrix acting on the two component commuting spinner P angle dot gives zero. And likewise for the square brackets, and this is true for both left and right multiplication. So all this says is that recall that we had our matrix that was a two by two matrix, which had determinant zero, which meant that it had rank one. If it has rank one, it must have null vectors and what we're now learning is that the p angle and p square spinners are nothing but the left and right multiplication null vectors of the two by two matrix p b dot p alpha b dot and and upper and lower all right so these are just null vectors of the matrices but then we should be able to write p in terms of these angles and square spinners how does this work well let me introduce it again from the qft point of view when you learn to compute scattering cross sections of particles like fermions, then you learn that there are some spin sum completeness relations. Basically, when you sum over the spin of the u and the u bars in the amplitude squared, absolute value squared, then you can replace this very conveniently with a p slash. And that's how you end up that cross sections depend on various traces of p slashes 
And that's typically how you learn to compute them in quantum field theory. Now let's use crossing to express u minus as v plus and u plus as v minus. Then that relations continue to hold. This is what we can do for these massless particles. And now writing it out using our definition of v plus and v minus, etc., in terms of the angles and square spinners, we get a 4 by 4 matrix written again in two component block form that we can compare to our p slash. And I can simply read off from this relation that my 2 by 2 matrix with lower indices is nothing but minus the product of a square spinner and an angle spinner. And likewise for the object with upper indices, which of course I get by simply raising the indices with two index Levi Vita symbols. Now the statement that p squared was zero was the same as saying that the determinant of the 2 by 2 p matrix was zero, which is to say that this 2 by 2 matrix has rank 1. When it has rank, a 2 by 2 matrix has rank 1, it can indeed be written as a product of two two-component vectors, and this is exactly what these expressions say. Sometimes that is the way that spinner helicity formalism is introduced. Sometimes it's written instead of angle and square bracket spinners as uh, lambdas and lambda tildes. But I feel that going from the quantum field theory point of view with Feynman rules and how you introduce them and how these are even related to the fermion wave functions is really a much more physical way of introducing these objects. By the way, now note, if we look at the Weyl equation again, then using our formalism now from P being written as this, this two by two form as a product of two two component commuting spinners, all we get then is that we get a contraction with the two p's and that is p bracket with itself and because of anti-symmetry of the levi Vita and the brackets that vanishes so this is clearly how you get zero and satisfy the vial equation that's just to illustrate how these identities are self-consistent okay now amplitudes are lorentz invariant objects depend on variables that are fully lorentz contracted such as the angle spinners that I just described, the angle spinner brackets, and the square spinner brackets. Note, by the way, here that I'm using a convention in which for dotted indices, I contract them down up, and for undotted indices, up down. This is the same convention as Wes and Bagger, if you have used that to learn a uh, component form of supersymmetry or and, and superfield form of supersymmetry. Now, what does this then have to do with Mandelstam variables? Well, let me show you. If I multiply together an angle and a square spinner with the same momentum labels i and j, and here, of course, this makes it implicit that i and j must be a massless, uh, an on-shell momentum for momentum, then I can rearrange my bracket by simply interchanging i and j here at the cost of a sign. Then let me write out what these two brackets actually say. I can combine then these i brackets, the angle and the square spinners, and then I can likewise combine the, the ones we label j, momentum label j. And now putting these together, I see that I get a j, which is nothing but pj, two component matrix, two by two matrix, as well as the pi but with upper indices, um, two by two matrix. And these two by two matrices are multiplied together and the indices fully contracted. So this is nothing but the trace of these two two by two matrices. And then working out the trace and your usual gamma algebra, you find that this is exactly two pi dot pj. But since pi dot pj, but since pi and pj are both null vectors, this is the same as pi plus pj squared as four vectors. And that is just exactly the same as our Mandelstam variable sij. And so here I'm summarizing the lesson that the Mandelstam variables that was so much the key ingredient for understanding the amplitudes of scalar amplitudes, they can be written fully in terms of angles and square brackets too. Therefore, the momentum dependence in any kind of vertex, as well as the propagators, can be described in terms of spinner brackets. And we know that the fermion wave functions can too, 
So now it's clear that all invariant amplitudes, uh, that all uh, tree-level amplitudes, in fact, all amplitudes of massless particles that involve scalars and fermions can be described in terms of the spin-up brackets. Let's do an example. We will go back to our case of a Yukawa coupling again and look at full particle scattering. I pick here positive velocities for particles 1 and 2, negative velocity for particles 3 and 4. The propagator is just a scalar, so it's 1 over S12. And then I don't have to think about U's and V bars and all that stuff or who's incoming and who's outgoing and what to do. I can simply say that every positive velocity particle will come with a square spinner. The negative velocity fermions will come with an angle spinner. And I can only contract these in one Lorentz invariant way to so up to a sign. I know what the amplitude is, and it is this expression g squared comes from the coupling, and then it's square spinner, square bracket 1, 2 times angle bracket 3, 4 divided by s12. Now this actually simplifies a bit because s12 is exactly the same as angle 1, 2 times square 1, 2, and putting that in, we nicely see how the square 1, 2s cancel, and we're left with a simple expression that's a ratio of two angle brackets. Note that the pole in the 1, 2 channel hasn't disappeared. It is manifested by the angle bracket 1, 2 sitting there. Note also that this is asymmetric or antisymmetric in the interchanges of identical fermions, either 1, 2 or 3, 4, just as it should be. But in order to then describe all amplitudes of massless particles, including those who spin 1, 3 halves, and 2, we need to express the polarizations for vectors in terms of spin helicity variables too. I'll simply give you the answer here for how to do this. For a negative helicity spin 1 particle, there's an expression for the polarization vector that looks like this, and one similarly for the positive helicity. Let me dissect this expression a little bit for one of these cases. The particle that comes in has momentum p. The polarization depends on this p. And it depends on it in two different places, through an angle bracket in the numerator and through a square spinner in the denominator. Oppositely, the, for the positive velocity case, the dependence sits as a square bracket in the numerator and as an ang bracket, angle bracket in the denominator. But then there's also a second dependence on these in, inside these polarization vectors, and those are q's. Now q's a priori has nothing to do with p. In fact, q must be different from p because otherwise the brackets in the denominators would vanish. The q's appear with the same square bracket in the numerator and denominator, same square spin and numerator and denominator for negative velocities, and, and likewise angles in the positive velocity case. What this q is, is a reference spinner. It encodes the fact that polarizations for a given momentum and helicity assignments is not unique. But you can always shift your polarization by some number alpha times the momentum associated with the particle. This freedom, which you may be familiar with from things like QED water densities and so on, that is encoded in Q. When you change Q, that amounts to changing how, the amount of P that you add to your polarization vector. Now, the other object that sits inside here in these polarization vectors is something that is like an angle square spinner that I haven't described yet. So how do we deal with such an angle square spinner? Or we call it sometimes an angle square bracket. Now, in an amplitude, what happens is that the polarizations that involve these angle square brackets will be dotted either into a momentum or into another polarization vector. So let's take those two in turn. If the polarization is dotted into some k, you will end up with a k vector dotted in to some angle square spinner of the form that I gave you. When k is dotted in to sigma bar, it simply becomes this 2 by 2 matrix, and the meaning of this angle square spinner is nothing but the multiplication of these two component spinner vectors into the uh, 2 by 2 matrix. So you could think of those roughly as rows of columns, 
vectors, which is why I call them spinner vectors, dotted in in the usual linear algebra sense. But if my k is null, I can write it in terms of an angle and a square bracket 2, uh, square spinner 2, and then I can find that my indices are contracted exactly the way I want them to in order to be spinner brackets, and I end up with a very simple result that an angle square contraction uh, of this form is exactly equal to a product of an angle bracket and a square bracket, so long as p squared is zero, because otherwise I couldn't write an angle and square spinner for it. Likewise, when I consider a polarization dotted into a polarization, I would have a contraction of two angle square brackets. And you can Fiert's, use Fiert's identity to uh, reconstruct that this is simply the same as 2 times an angle bracket times a square bracket. And so that uh, becomes a very, very useful identity to have to simplify amplitudes if you were to calculate them from Feynman rules, as we'll see very often in, is in fact not needed. Okay. So the upshot here is that amplitudes of theories with only massless particle, particles can be expressed completely in terms of angle and square brackets. We've dealt with spin 0, spin 1 half, and spin 1, and I showed you in the very early part of the lecture that spin 3 half and spin 2 polarizations can be composed out of the fermion wave functions and the spin 1 polarizations. So we're done. Everything can be expressed in terms of angle and square brackets. And so what, you might say? Well, it turns out that this is very, very powerful. Why is it powerful? It's powerful because the normal constraint of insisting that p squared is zero is in a certain sense trivialized here. By the way, I should note that the q dependence that sits inside the polarizations will eventually drop out from any amplitude expressions because an amplitude can't depend on some arbitrary uh, spinner or vector in the system because that would break Lorentz invariance. All right, now in order to see how powerful this is, we need one more thing, and that is the last part of this lecture. It is called the little group scaling. Now recall that the little group is something that leaves an on-shell momentum invariant. And so in particular, for a momentum that uh, is a null momentum, I'll have it in a form, I could write it in a form as energy, comma zero, comma zero, comma energy, uh, if I just align it along the z-axis. And you can see that this is left invariant by any rotations that are taking place in the xy plane. So that's an SO2 rotation, and SO2 I can think of as a U1 transformation if I complexify things. Let's come back to that in a second, but just keep it in mind. Now we've written our on-shell momenta. These are p squared equal to zero momenta, of course. We've written our on-shell massless momenta in terms of the angle and the square spinners. But there's an ambiguity or redundancy in this description, which is that if I were to scale my angle spinners oppositely from my square spinners by some parameter t, then p, of course, stays invariant. That ambiguity is just inherently in that formalism. Now, any internal part of a Feynman diagram, a vertex or a propagator, depends on p, but not on the angle or square spinners by themselves. So this is manifestly invariant under such a little group scaling. By the way, uh, what, why do I call this a little group scaling? It was a little group scaling because if t is a, is a phase, if t is a complex number, that's a phase, that is exactly related to that u1 transformation right there. On the other hand, if I allow myself to have complex momenta, t can in fact be any complex number whenever p is complex, meaning the components of p are allowed to be complex. That's a complex continuation, which we don't need to work with here, but, well, which we will will work with here in certain contexts, but otherwise, in general, for p to be real, if this is real, then I'd have to have that p star is actually equal to, uh, so, so p angle star is equal to p square, etc. But for p complex, then p angle 
and p square are unrelated. And if that's the case, then I can rescale them by any complex number that I like. Whereas if it's real, my t will have to have uh, uh, have to just be a face. Okay, as you, as you might convince yourself. Now that's a minor technical point. The point here really is that I'll allow myself to work with complex momenta, so angle and square spinners are independent, and I can rescale them independently with t and t inverse while leaving the momentum alone. Secondly, the internal part, as I mentioned, of a Feynman diagram is invariant under this little group scaling. However, the external lines are not. So let's now come back to our external line rules and see how they changes with a little group scaling. Obviously, for a scalar particle, nothing changes because the external line rule is just one. For the fermion lines, we know that the external wave function for positive and negative velocity are the square and angles respectively, and so they will scale, just as I said, with a little group scaling with either t to the minus 1 or t to the plus 1. Now, the polarizations, I emphasized earlier that the positive helicity guy depends on p square in the numerator and p angle in the denominator. Since they scale the opposite way, the scaling adds up and gives us t to the minus 2. Note, by the way, that since there's angle q, there's no scaling with a reference spinner, which is a good thing. For negative helicity, likewise, p has angle in the numerator, p square in the denominator, so this adds up to a net of scaling with t to the plus 2. And now you can see the pattern that for any helicity case, t will scale with t to the minus 2, the helicity of that associated particle. Great. Similarly, if you were to do this for spin 3 halves or spin 2, that same scaling would hold. So here's an important lesson, that under the little group scaling of particle i, the amplitude will scale with t to minus 2 times hi, and that is true for every one of the external particles, 1 through n in an n particle amplitude. Now we're ready to apply this toolbox of spinner helicity formalism, little group scaling, and that is exactly what we'll do in the second part of lecture two.